in uh, Lahore. This is now in Pakistan. I was myself a uh, student in secondary school. What do you call it? Secondary primary school. Yes. yes. One of the school is she used to go to school with me. Was a very very intelligent girl. She got fever and she died. So I was her neighbor, so I ran to her house to see what happened. I saw my dead, her parents were there, they were all mourning. Doctors came in, examined her, pronounced her dead. By all available means, no one was dead. So they set all made all the preparations for burial. So do not embalm the bodies like this sometimes we do here, so they just put the body in the coffin and take her to the burial ground. So they put the body in the coffin and took her to the burial ground. And I was very sad to miss her company. We used to walk to school sometimes. Nice, sweet girl, a good friend of mine. So when they took her to the burial ground, and the grave was ready, and they lowered the grave. They were just about to cover it up, and uh, they found some sign of movement. Somebody was trying to open the grave. They immediately pulled it up. This is probably not there. And they took the lid off, the coffin. The girl sat up and walked out. Mm -hmm. She was. She had no fever. And she went to school next morning with me. <laughs> we both walked together. And I said, to her, I said, uh, after what happened, that was a Muslim, Muslim girl. <laughs> she did not believe in reincarnation and all these uh, various philosophies about death. She belonged to a religion with some different uh, belief system. So I said, what happened to you? I thought you were dead. He said, I never died. I don't know how they thought I was dead. I know I was uh, I was not feeling too good. And my parents were sitting around me. And I couldn't speak to them. And two guys came. And uh, she described those guys. They came. And uh, doors in India uh, are wooden doors that open up. Two doors. So if you want to close the door, it's opened up like this. So the doors, you can have an edge, ledge of the door. So two guys came and they sat on top of the doors. Very odd. Visitors come to our house. They never jump up on top of the door and with their legs hanging. They were sitting up there. She felt it was very odd. And since her mother and father were sitting on either side of her bed, she tried to point out to them, what is happening? Why are they sitting on top of the door? Tried to speak, but... She felt she was almost dead. She couldn't open her mouth. I couldn't speak. So she tried to move and point out. She couldn't raise her hand. She felt that she was just too mobile. She couldn't move. Didn't know what was happening. And she wondered why they don't notice. There were other people coming in and out of the room and they never noticed those two guys sitting up on the door. So ultimately, and she says, those guys jumped down one after the other. They seemed to be talking something to each other which she couldn't hear. They jumped down and they, one went towards her feet, one went towards her head. They picked her up and she said, nobody noticed. She was looking at her parents. What are they doing? The strangers have come into the house. They are lifting me bodily from my bed. But they don't even bother. And they lifted her bodily from the bed and they took her right up and she said she might hit against the ceiling. But they went right through the ceiling along with her and began to fly. And she flew with them and it was so strange and she she enjoyed it for a while. <laughs> she never knew she could fly. So she listened to, she forgot all about what happened in the room. She was all interested in what was going on in the sky. And they were flying and she overheard them talking. And they were talking in her language, which is Urdu. Just pure Urdu. They spoke in that language. And they talked to each other. And then one of them, she says, I don't know how long we flew. It must be a long flight. We went very high. We don't know where we were flying. It was in the sky. 
to remember that. And then one of them said, oh, we made a mistake. This was not her day. And immediately when that man said, the other one said, yes. And they started descending. And they descended very fast, but she didn't know what was happening. She thought, now this time I'm going to knock against something. And when she says, she hit, as if she hit the ground, she felt that somebody had put a wooden plank on her face and she tried to push it off. And then I walked out. I don't know anything else. Such innocent statement that little girl made. I heard it myself. And I said, what is this? Did she die or is she not die? What is she talking about? I had a very hard time understanding what happened. But I know we, we people don't fly. Though I had a little personal experience of flying, which was a little different than this one, taught by another lady when I was very small. But I, I could not connect this experience as a experience of death. It looked like it was just a continuous experience. She was experiencing one thing and then she was experiencing something else. And then she was again experiencing something else. And who are we? We heard the story. Who are we? Who is she? What is our relationship? Who is real in this game? All these thoughts came up to me. And I walked with her next day, third day. I said, this is strange. She says, yeah, it's very strange. But let's get back to studies and exams. And the following uh, Sunday or Monday, whichever day she had died, she died again. And never came back. They waited long for her to wake up again. She stayed very within one week of this incident. This particular incident left such a deep impression on my mind. I said, what happens to me? And this girl, by all known standards, was dead. She was not near death that she was about to die and came back. A, a sister-in-law, uh, my, my wife's sister, undergoing a difficult labor, a childbirth, the doctor said her pulse has stopped. She's about dead. When she had that experience, she narrated that experience to me many years later after this experience. And she felt she was separated from the body and she heard a strange sound of, as if a big wheel was rotating and uh, a voice was constantly speaking to her saying, this is the law. It's the law that governs everything. This law runs in. You are just part of the law. And she kept on hearing this, which didn't make sense to her. The law goes beyond you. The law goes beyond masters. The law goes beyond God. The law runs in. She couldn't understand. And then that voice said, I will show you the law. And she's had an experience of being on that wheel, which was moving. And she said it was not a physical wheel. It was a wheel, but not a physical wheel. And that wheel, when she was on the wheel, she got all the knowledge. This is all being run according to a plan. And the plan is so profound and deep, it goes beyond our own egos and our individual things. And that plan is relentless and just goes on. And we are just part of it. All this she got in a few seconds on that wheel. And she was back again and pulse was normal. Doctor said she saved. Maybe that was near that. I don't know. I have seen some of these experiences of associates or other people. And it appears to me that uh, this is an area worth investigating. So when I talked about it to my master, the GM, great master, he said, this is not a problem to find out the truth. The best thing is not to be speculative about it. Don't speculate what is death. Don't speculate what happens after death. Because all speculation leads to concepts. Every time you want to speculate what may be happening, you build up a new concept. And a concept can take you away from experience.
more certainly than anything else. Very powerful point. When we speculate, anticipate, and presume that we can judge in advance what it might be, that is the greatest stumbling block to knowledge. Because by making our own concept, our own anticipation, we try to trigger off experience and channel the experience to fit in with the concept we have already prepared. So the experience, the reality, the truth may be just passing by and we miss it. Therefore, do not speculate. Even after hearing these stories, do not speculate. And I said, oh, what should one do? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we are, more than we are so taught to thinking about things. We are taught to contemplate things, think for yourself. Every time we think for ourselves, we speculate. We begin to wonder, is it like this? Is it like this? He said, it is inevitable that we should think. But you can think in two ways. You can think, is it like this? Then remember, this becomes a concept. When you think to yourself, I want to know truth. Is truth like this? And this becomes a concept that holds you down. You don't see truth anymore. But you can speculate and think and consider and contemplate what is true. Let it come. I will see with my own eyes. I will see with my own experience. I will go through it, whatever it is. I don't care what it looks like, what it is. I'll see as it comes. And I will not go and stop on the way till I see with my own eyes. If that is so, you will see truth. Truth will come running to you. <laughs> if you are so ready to see truth without your concepts, without your anticipations, truth will come running. Maybe truth is already waiting in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> you may find that what was in front of you was the truth. You may find that what was there was the truth. There are no concepts. I said, no, but I was not interested in truth. <laughs> I was interested in death and life after death. These so-called experiences. How about that? And uh, the master said, <clears throat> if you have met somebody who is dead and has not revived in the physical body, then you can ask this question. If a person is dead, is not revived, and therefore is absolutely dead, <laughs> you are not in doubt about whether it is near death or far death or deep death. <laughs> if you are sure it is just death, the person is no longer there, the physical body has been consumed and become ashes, and the person then tells you, then you can talk and ask this question. Otherwise, you can die yourself and see. <laughs> I said, you mean, just to discover the reality of, uh, of uh, the spiritual reality of our own spirit beyond body, and what happens when we are beyond body, one has to commit suicide, one has to die in order to see. He said, the truth is, we don't have to die but we have to experience what it is to die. You can you see what happens when people die. What happens? Let's study that. And then you see, if you had that experience, what would happen? Then you will know personally, without asking questions. Go and see what happens when people die. I used to go to college by the time this conversation took place uh, in an arts college in the hall. And a friend of mine, tall friend, used to go to the medical college. He's a very brilliant boy studying medicine. And I asked him, his name was Safuddin. I said, Safuddin, you are a medical student and you go and see people, they die in hospital every day. He says, yeah, somebody or the other is dying all the time. And we start our courses by seeing dead bodies. The first course we were starting on anatomy was, to go and see dead bodies. 
when we go and the, the, the doctors play jokes with us to frighten us, to frighten us. One doctor used to go and lie amongst the dead bodies himself. <laughs> he would first tell the students, go and uh, put this uh, piece of wool, cotton wool, in the mouth of each of these uh, cadavers. They used to call the bodies cadavers. And then while they were putting those pieces of cotton balls, then the doctor would like say, give me one, two. They used to take the fear of their, out of people. They used to take the fear out of people. Because the doctor was telling that one of the things we have to overcome in order to study the subject is fear. And he said people are not only afraid of death themselves, they are afraid of death around People are even afraid of dead body. It may not walk up. And then that uh, doctor used to play jokes in the new interns who would come in. And while lying down, pretending to dead body, he would sit up there and then lie. <laughs> he scared them away. So they had to do many things to overcome the fear that is associated with death. Uh, in terms of uh, study of death, or what is death? It is necessary to know why we associate fear with death. Why are we afraid of death? We are afraid of death because the only existence we are experiencing, the only life we know, is the life that is with us because of this body. The life that we can experience around us in the physical world, which is being assimilated, being experienced, being picked up in a sensory perception, being picked up by the physical body. We do not know any other. Sometimes a thought comes into the head which is not physical, but we want to make it physical and we put the thought in a framework connected with the physical connotation and it becomes a thought. If it is not connected with the physical experience, we dismiss it. We don't even see it. Therefore, our whole life seems to revolve around where we are now, which is physical. The physical body becomes real. The physical senses are the only means of knowing this physical world. And the rest is just speculation. And therefore, this being real for us, if something happens, to somebody like us, which makes this existence cease, be it is gone, finished, and to disappear completely into the void, into nothingness, which seems to be happening in the physical level. If our reality is this physical body and the physical world, and physical death means what we see our friends and others going through, when they finish, they just finish. We can't get through to them again. If this is it and going to happen to us, we are frightened of it. We are frightened of losing what we have. We are so frightened of losing what we have that even if what we have is not too good, if so we can put up with this Lord, give us a few more moments. <laughs> so we are constantly afraid of death because of lack of any experience. Whether there is something beyond. And although we study books, we study scriptures, we hear discourses, and we go through all this information, we pack ourselves with information that there are higher levels of consciousness, there are higher regions, there are heavens and hells, and we can go into all those places. All these turn out to be concepts when we are in the physical world. And being concepts, to search for them leads us nowhere. That is it strange state to be in. That the only reality we have is the physical world. The only experience we have is of the physical world. The only abstract, intangible things we have, like thoughts, ideals, jealousy, passion, imagination, are all related to physical perception. What do we do? Somebody wants to describe heaven? It's a beautiful place, lovely flowers, great lights shining, everybody's shining, clouds, beauty. 
Has any element been mentioned which is not here? We are picking up the same physical elements. We, we describe heavens in the same terms that heaven must be real because they resemble the real thing here. But this is strange that we are caught in a state of living, in a state of existence, in a state of experiencing in which the physical self, physical sensations, physical perceptions, physical friends, physical homes, physical money, physical things, physical articles, physical relationships, alone seem to be real. On top of that, we load them with speculations of what could be immortal. The soul is immortal. Why? A physical book says so. Why? Because a physical person in a discourse said so. Because a physical sermon heard with physical ears said so. No other testimony. We have no testimony about any existence other than what we are having in the physical body, in a physical world. When we try to investigate through this physical apparatus, things beyond death, things beyond this life, and we relate it to what we are having here, we end up in concepts which are born out of this physical reality. We find out. People get into meditation. They do meditation on the same assumption. Now we have to look for this. What do you have to look for? Look for the light. Look for the radiant form of the master. Look for the higher regions. Look for thousand petal lotus. Look for light shining. You already prepared the concepts. So you close your eyes and you stay where you are, waiting for them. If your imagination is strong, you see them. <laughs> if it is not strong, if it is not strong, it is darkness. Where do we go from there? This is the real situation we are in. And this was the situation that I was posing to the great master. Yes. And I said, how can we find reality without these concepts? He said, one should be ready to experiment without expectation, without setting up anything by way of an expectation or an anticipation or a speculation. If you can do that, you will see reality. <laughs> But if you are constantly anticipating, you will remain in physical life. I said, but uh, we are talking of physical depth now. We have no other information. He said, go and study. Now, I am sharing with you today. I, know. I became, I became a, a irregular student of the medical college. Irregular, I was not enrolled there. I used to go with my friend Safudu and I used to wear the white cloak and carry a stethoscope around my neck to look like a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to enter the operation theatres and the morgues and their uh, anatomy classes to see the bodies and the cadavers and see what is inside and see what happens to people when they die. And I spent two years doing this. I cut my own classes and got a third division in my Bachelor of Science examination and spent most of time in the medical college. Why? I wanted to know what happens to people when they die. And I found what happened to people was very simple. I saw so many of them. Some died so quickly they never told you what was happening. You couldn't get any information. Some died so slowly. You had to wait for years sitting on their bedside to know. <laughs> it's very hard to find those cases which in a short time that you have could tell you what was happening. But to cut the long story short, people who died physically, they saw them. And they talked. They talked from the mouth, from the lips. They talked what was happening. They would talk and say, I don't know, can you put my foot on the right side, the foot was already in the right side. <laughs> My foot seems to be stretched up, left foot. Sister, nurse, I would call sister, the nurse, will you please straighten out my leg, but the leg was already straight. I began to see, why are they having these experiences? First of all, they are having some distorted experience about their own body. What is actually happening? Then, 
I made more study, I found they are losing the awareness of what is happening in the extremities of their body. And it was so universal. And even if it happened over a long period of time or a short period of time, it looks like the process of death affects awareness. What you are aware of. When you are living, we say, he is alive and kicking. Now, then I understood why they say alive and kicking. He kicks with the press. Sure, where is for press? But when a person is dying, he is no longer alive and kicking, he doesn't even know where his foot is. And so this absence of awareness of his foot, his hand, the extremities, and then subsequently of his knees, and the elbows, and the arms, and the legs, this must be preliminary to dying. As one watched that process, in a number of cases, not one or two, one found that in the process of death, there was a withdrawal of awareness of the body starting from extremities and going on and the person still speaks and is alive. And when the awareness disappears from the torso and from when it comes near the head and the person can't say that, the person is dead. I said, I don't want to compare it with any concepts. But it fitted in very well with the known knowledge about physical death, which the doctors were confirming, which were saying, the heart stops, it's pretty close to death. But the real death is when the brain stops and the real life force is operating from the head. And it is from here it seems to spread out and give all the instructions to the whole body. So it appeared that a person who is dying is probably losing awareness of the extremities. Gradually the loss of awareness is coming up the rest of the body and ultimately ends up with the head. When that is lost, you are dead. I said, that looks pretty sound experientially. Now, what can we do to personally simulate this? Not say what happens, just simulate. Is there a method by which we can simulate the same process, a living person? Is there a method by which we can, sitting alive, have an experience generated in our body in which we should lose awareness of the extremities and gradually lose more and more awareness proceeding from the tips of the toes, the tips of the fingers, and coming all the way back to the head. And if we can do that, artificially, maybe we'll find out what's going on with those guys who are dying. Why not try it out? Then came the teachings, the correct teaching of meditation or the description of meditation as a means of dying while living. And that was studied in relation to actual dying of people. It fitted in completely. That the process of real meditation, or the process of real introspection, or the process of real self-realization, was to withdraw awareness from the extremities, and bring it back to the head till you become unaware even of the head. That looks like very sound logic even to a mind that doesn't want concepts. It's logical. It makes sense. Then, the experiments were done by me, by other people, by a lot of friends sitting together. It was great fun. We didn't take it like, uh, like uh, a about religious right. We said it's great fun to find out what happens. We die. So, so we found that what makes us aware of our extremities of the body is the fact that something is happening to the <clears throat> different parts of the body which takes our attention there. I could find that if I have a shoe that pinches me, I can't withdraw my attention from it. I am having a pleasant taste in my tongue, I am enjoying my food, I can't withdraw my attention from there or my awareness from there. So I found that these pains and pleasures, 
relatable to the physical body. We are helping to keep me alive in the physical body. And so long as there was pain and pleasure in the physical body, I couldn't die. At least not artificially. That so long as this body is the source of my pain and pleasure, there was no way to become unaware of the extremities and to go somewhere else. Now I was finding that 24 hours the body is subject to pain and pleasure. 24 hours. So there was no correct time for meditation. I was looking for a time which would be good when one can meditate. Then I realized that we have to use a process by which the pain and pleasure gets intensified somewhere else. So that the attention gets withdrawn. Now I knew a very heartless surgeon in that hospital. When the patient would come groaning with pain, he would just use a knife. And within a few minutes, the patient would forget the pain. Looking at that knife. Doctor <laughs> <laughs> used it wonderfully. He just sometimes just make a few scratches here, he forgets that he has any pain anywhere else. And that was a great indicator for me. The indicator was that it is not merely the pain and pleasure equally distributed that scatters your attention or spreads your awareness. That you can intensify your pain and pleasure at one point, thereby becoming unaware of the others. That was great. This was the key. I'm sharing with you today that the key to discovering what happens to a person when he dies what happens to consciousness when it dies is this ability to intensify your experience of pleasure and pain at one spot, thereby becoming unaware of the other spot. That's the whole secret. And if one can do it, one has got it. So the secret lay in our ability to intensify pleasure and pain at one spot in the body, so that we do not distribute our attention and therefore our awareness to the rest of the body. So I said, let, let us see what is the best spot. We have to discover one spot. I thought the best is to use my finger and put it in front of me. All right. I put all my intensity, all my attention into it and visualized, imagined, did everything. It didn't work. It didn't do any good. I found that the pleasure and pain was never on the finger. I found that pleasure and pain is inside the head. When I felt happy to meet somebody and shook his hand, the pleasure was not on the hand, but there. I found when there was pain, I was groaning there, not where the pain was. Time to find out. I found out that the actual seat of pleasure and pain is all up here. Why? Because we are aware of it over here. And therefore, the, the area where the awareness of pleasure and pain is taking place is all confined in a very small area, just in the head. So I said, now we are closer to that single spot which one can find. To intensify that experience and thereby get an experience of withdrawal of awareness and attention from the rest of the body. Now, if we do that, this is what I'm suggesting to everybody. This is experimental. <laughs> this is not a ritual. This is not a ceremony. This is not a traditional meditation. This is an experiment. This is an experiment with dying while living. This is an experiment to find out what possible experience one can have if one simulates the same experience which those people dying in hospitals have and they never come back to tell us. And we don't have contact with them in the form in which they are. We don't even know there is a form. We have no idea. This is all the form we know of. So why not do it ourselves? Now when one does this experiment of putting one's attention Within the head, at a very nice spot, which is the source of pain and pleasure. What is that spot? 
took it, if it took a while, I find a spot. The spot couldn't be one ear, this ear, these eyes, top of the head. So when you start looking at the whole area, looking at the whole area, not speculating, not philosophizing, not trying to determine by any prior concept, but looking objectively at the area in the head, which is that area, you find there is an area from where you are looking. Then you close your eyes and say, think to yourself, now I want to find a spot. You just think this thought. Close your eyes and think this thought, now I want to find a spot where I have to look. You will notice that there is a spot from where you set this question. This very question has come from a spot which is inside the head. Why not go to that spot? Made things very easy. Because this question was put in the head from the very spot where all pain and pleasure takes place. Makes it beautiful. And if one spends enough time on this, uh, not take it casually or uh, just for the sake of a weekend, uh, weekend study, but regular, if you are really interested in this, you can find that the spot in the head that very location in the head where we can say, now, where am I asking this question from myself? Not verbally with the mouth or the lips, mentally with consciousness. When mentally with consciousness, with a thought, we put this question to ourselves, now, where am I asking this question? Where am I looking out from? One comes very, very to the center of the head, not in any human area, right in the center. And the more you explore where you are, the more you come to the center. Now, when we guys were exploring this, we were little kids. In terms of the age now, I have, now I'm a veteran. <laughs> but at that time, we enjoyed this very much. We enjoyed it because it was so fresh. It's such a novel thing to do. You find out the truth about yourself. That this particular approach of finding oneself had a tremendous effect. We found that if we spent a few days just trying to figure out where we are, where are we, where am I, where am I, if we do this, we forget your feet and your hands. But that was a strange experience. Why did that happen? Why should it happen that when you are just trying to find the location, with nothing else, no meditation, you are just trying to find the location of where you are, where are you calling out for, from, where are you thinking from, where are you as a conscious being inside, right? When you are closing and you are thinking and imagining, where are you doing it from? Are you located or are you scattered? If you are scattered, scattered from where? If you try to pull this attention back, pull this awareness back, to the point where you are questioning it from, you notice that particular spot, not only you are attracted to that, but this is the very process of concentrating awareness. The more you want to be aware of that process, the more you concentrate your attention and the very process of death starts taking place. This is a very good key to those who want to experiment dying while living. Very good. Put your whole attention. Uh, the statement would be, put your entire attention to the maximum of your ability, to the maximum of your time, at the center in the middle of the head from where you are spreading it out now. Put your whole attention in discovering where you are and talk to yourself and question where you are. And if the thoughts take you away, substitute them. By repetition of the mantra or the simran, the holy words, which are given by the master, which have no association with a concept, which have no association with anything known physically externally. It's a good device.
Because when people try to do it, when the people try to center themselves, what they call centering, they use very often. But some phrases, some words have become very popular. Void, centering, within, outside. So when you talk of a center of consciousness, or the center from where awareness is spreading out in the body and therefore in the world, you find the center in the, really in the middle of the head and can be called appropriately the real conscious center behind the eyes, inside the head, between the ears. And since it is a center where we are one and the eyes are two outside, and we look out to the eyes as one image, one viewer. It is not in the eyes. If the center was in the eyes, then we would have two viewers. But the center is one because there is one viewer using two eyes. So when you look at this situation, you find that behind the eyes, like this, behind the eyes in the center, you must be sitting there as consciousness. If you can withdraw your attention to that conscious point behind the two eyes, which for facility we might call the third eye. So that's the viewing eye. The third eye center. The Dala Ablangata. Is that the spot you mean? That's close to it. <laughs> we don't, because I was looking at that in the, in the cadavers, and uh, I found that uh, that is a fixed spot. The Madula Ablangata is a fixed spot. It is a fixed portion of the brain. Fixed. Fixed portion of the brain. But I found that when we are awake, we are not at a fixed place. We move. When we are high, the sexuality, we are not at the spot. We are higher. When we are sleeping, we are lower. So when we are sleeping, we are lower. When we are high, we are high. Now that spot, the third eye center, behind the eyes, from where one can have these experiences, that being within, if, uh, if a person like a master, a great master, when I met him and he taught me meditation and the way he answered these questions, I knew he had done it himself. Nobody can say, don't go after concepts, don't go after this, just go inside. Don't go, don't go to anything other than your own center. Nobody will say unless he has been inside. Because it is much easier to teach concepts. All the teachers teach concepts who have not gone inside. It's so easy to teach a concept. And you can make a concept anytime you like, speculatively. Therefore, a person who comes and teaches you to experience personally without concept. I cannot imagine such a person coming and teaching us to experience personally without concepts. Unless he has experienced, what is he talking about other words? Such a person talks only about experience, sir, not about concept. And he leaves you to make your concept after you have had an experience, but not before. When you withdraw your attention by following the process, the procedure, why is the procedure necessary? Because our mind scatters attention again and again. When we try to sit within the head, the thoughts come and drive us crazy. As never before, in day to day life, we are moving around, doing our routine things. You say, I'm going to do these things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And start one, two, three. Four. Mind is very much at peace. You prepare any plan for the day and keep on doing it mechanically. The mind <laughs> likes it. Wonderful. Never resists, never fights. But you say, give up those 10 points, I want to go into one single third eye center. Yeah. And the mind goes crazy and tries to think of things, forgotten things, unimportant things, everything it brings up at that time. Thereby making meditation at the third eye center. It makes meditation a roaming exercise. <laughs> the mind makes us go all over the world when we want to be here. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the problem with the mind, for which we need some guidance and help. If this problem were not there, we wouldn't need masters. We could just sit there, <laughs> in some contemplation, go to nice resorts, 
Some nice holiday resorts, some mountain peace, Himalayas. Even we could go and sit on the bank of Lake Tahoe or Lake Geneva, any <laughs> place. Peaceful and just close eyes and withdraw and say we found it. Yeah. But the mind doesn't work like that. The mind goes crazy and thinks of everything at that time. As if it is as if it is resisting this. The mind seems to function as if it is resisting this particular thing we are trying to do. Now, why is it resist? It's a good question which we find when we do. Now, these are experiential things I'm talking about, not concepts or theories at all anymore. When we experience, when we actually try to put our mind within ourselves, we find the mind resists because the mind's existence depends upon scattering. If you don't scatter and don't think of anything, the mind is dead. The mind must survive. For its own survival, it resists our trying to find out what would happen if we are in the head. Yeah. Therefore, thinks more than ever before. Yeah. In meditation, the mind thinks more than it normally does. Therefore, we have to go and seek some help from someone who has done it, not someone who can speculate about it. And that's the difference between a philosopher and a master. A master is one who has done it. And a philosopher is one who can speculate how to do it without having done it. So when we go to a master and he teaches us the way of doing it, which we call initiation. Initiation by a master really means learning how to do 